a little longer. Uh, so, and, and, and worst of all, when, when uh, Yeltsin took over, people just stopped having children, so, you know, as, you, as you mentioned. And so the population tree looks something like this. You know, it just, it, it, look, it looks like a, a not, I don't know what it looks like, but it comes up and then it goes up like this. Uh, and unless Putin can come up with some way of having women give birth to 12 years olds, you know, you're never going to fill this, this here. So, so the, the number of people who are entering the workforce now, because that's, that's this, this area here, uh, is very low. And that also means the army. That also means that you're not going to have people for, for the military. And so this, the population thing is real. Well, in H, well that's, that's why one of the reasons why life expectancy is so, so short, uh, 58, 59, uh, alcoholism, uh, smoking has dropped a little bit, but traffic accidents. <coughs> <laughs> one of the, our sessions with Putin, he was asked about this, and he said, well, if you live to 65, you're okay, but you've got to be able to survive those traffic deaths, the alcoholism. Then once you're 65, your life expectancy would be like it is in other countries, but you, you, we can't get people up there. And so Putin, recognizing this, has reintroduced uh, programs that used to be uh, uh, prominent in the Soviet era where you give big bonuses to women with lots of children. Uh, but marriage is also a problem. I mean, you know, it's somewhat like the United States now. There, there are fewer people, more, more and more people are having children out of wedlock, which is, which is uh, not a good way to bring up children. Uh, and so they're, they're worried about this. And they, they, so it's, he's got his hands full this way, and it, it does indeed suggest that uh, Putin's aspirations, I think he has aspirations to be a super military power. The trouble is the military right now is not in a position to do it, and their draftees uh, aren't going to be there, and there are all ways of getting out of the draft. There are all kinds of other things. that They torture the draftees in ways that death, suicide rate among draftees is, you know, one of the highest rates in the world because they just can't take the hazing. Uh, you know, it, it's, it's just everything that could go wrong, they, they do. So uh, the population thing is clearly something that uh, uh, is a nightmare that Putin has to deal with, and his successor has to deal with. Uh, here, the mic here for this. Uh, Peter, yeah. one of the solutions I heard to Russia's declining population is that since China has a surplus of men, and Russia has a surplus of women, that you're going to find the average couple be an older Russian woman with a younger Chinese husband. <laughs> and I, I read that somewhere, but I can't give you the source. Um, Professor Goldman, back to the conversation that we had briefly during the uh, reception about Iran, referring to the Islamic question. I'm really quite worried about Russia having provided Iran with technology for nuclear power that has dual use and not having made agreements to get back the spent fuel up front, which I don't think they didn't. You can correct me if I'm wrong. And it's a little bit late to lock the barn right now. Couldn't they be doing more to restrain Iran from developing nuclear weapons? Because it will activate Russia's Muslims. Don't they understand that? Uh, the, uh, actually, it's an interesting question. The, um, the Russians are aware of this. Putin is aware of this. You know, Putin is, whatever you want to say about Putin, he's not a dummy. Uh, and he's very conscious of this thing. I, in fact, the, the last visit we had to this, this group that goes over there and we meet with him at the end really was looking at uh, a Russian, uh, a bit, uh, the Islamic question. And they took us to Kazan, which is the head of the capital of the Tatar uh, Republic in, inside Russia. And uh, we spent a lot of time going to the mosque, a lot of time going to the Russian Orthodox Church, uh, hearing both the local imam and the local patriarch there uh, talk about how well they're getting along with each other. Um, so this is something they, they really are worried about and they're very sensitive to. There was a time when, uh, uh, to his credit, Putin said, okay, we're going to stop, just stop the construction of that, of that reactor because we were, the Russians did not have the guarantee they were looking for. Uh, I've heard from American diplomats uh, in Moscow that they are satisfied with the uh, sharing of intelligence that the Russians uh, have provided with the United States. You know, it, it's not so much Iran that the Russians worry about, although they, it, it, you know, if there's a problem, they're much closer to Iran than, than we are in this country. Uh, it's, it's Afghanistan, 
Uh, and, uh, you know, the, the, the Russians have had their experience in Afghanistan. It's their Vietnam, uh, or if you want, their Iraq, uh, if you will. And it's, it's, it, they were just, one of the reasons for this whole collapse was that they just ran aground uh, in Afghanistan. So they're, they appreciate that. And um, again, one of the, I think, the, the merits of this Bush-Putin relationship is that that has served as one of the areas where they do cooperate. So in answer to your question, yes, there's much more I, I would like uh, Russia to do. But again, unlike what it was in the Soviet era, where, you know, in the case of Iraq, for example, even under, under Gorbachev, the Russians purposely uh, did everything they could to expand not just the civilian use of nuclear energy, but military use of energy as a way of, of provoking us, as a way of harassing us. And uh, that's, that's not happening now. There's not that kind of rivalry, uh, provocation that existed earlier. A lot more could be done, and I would hope that it would be. But uh, it's not as bad as, as it could be. I hope you'll press them when you go over there. Sure. <laughs> uh, Cedric, please. Goldman. The mic, Mike, please. Thank you. Thank you. Professor Goldman, you've alluded to the poor state of manufacturing, but could you say something more about the general state of the economy and how well it's functioning? Yeah. The banking system, credit systems, uh, smaller shops, uh, other forms of, of business, because you sort of get the feeling that there is this huge amount of wealth floating around, but at the same time, uh, the rest of the economy uh, is a real question mark. Yeah, we talked a little bit about this uh, earlier. Uh, overall, you know, the, all this money flowing in covers a lot of uh, problems. It, it masks a lot of problems. And um, all that oil revenue, but, but you know, as, as I said before, all that oil revenue means, you can, or as, as Wayne said, you have the Dutch disease, so manufacturing suffers. But the bigger problem is corruption. The bigger problem is that um, uh, there's no tradition of independence from the government. So for me, the biggest uh, index or marker of, of Russia's, the state of the health of Russian economy is what is the role of small business? Can you start small business? What is the role of innovation? And there it's, it's very dismal. Uh, the share of small business in the GDP is, in Russia is 10 to 15%. Whereas in this country, it's 50% uh, or more. In Europe, it's, it's, it's about that high. I mean, as somebody whose son is, was an entrepreneur who's indeed sold his business to a company here in, in uh, Atlanta, uh, I'm very much a, a proponent of small business and, and watching innovation. And in Russia, innovation, you start up, the minute that you, I did some interviewing along these lines with people who'd set up their own business. The minute that you put an ad in the paper that you're doing well or that you're looking for partners, you get a visit from the mafia. And today, it's not the mafia so much as the government, and you can't distinguish where the mafia begins and the government ends uh, because in very, it's, it's much the same kind of thing. So this is just terribly destructive. I, instead of encouraging this kind of thing, it, it just, you, you you, you knock it right down, uh, and, 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 and you, you, you hurt it. Now, you know, the, the, Putin understands this, I think, and, and tries to do something about it, but so far not been very successful. The new president, uh, Dmitry Medvedev, who comes from uh, Gazprom, which is not a small company, uh, I think understands this a little bit. He was trained as a lawyer. He practiced law. He believes in the rule of the law. And in fact, one of the things he said in... in in describing what was going on with the Western oil companies and the oligarchs, he said, we had the nihilism of the law. You know, just it's, the rule of law is just gone. And so one of the things he said early on, he's only been the president for a few weeks, he said, one of the things I want to do is to set up a commission on corruption, and I'll, be the, I'll chair it. And for me, this was a signal, this was a dig at Putin. Uh, it, why is there a need for such a, a commission? Because things have deteriorated, things have gotten worse. Uh, on your watch, and, and you, a former lieutenant colonel in the KGB, should have been able to cope with this, and instead it's gotten worse. And, and on the list, you know, the, interne the 